Kumar Sri Ranjit Singh Ji, better known as just Ranji, innovator of the glance, one of the greatest batsmen the world has seen, later the ruler of the erstwhile Western Indian state of Nawanagar. I suppose it was he who, with his remarkable performances for Sussex and England, first drew the attention of the then international cricketing authorities to the future potential of Indian cricket, and indeed to India in the long run being accorded test recognition in 1932. It's not very well known that India was supposed to make their first appearance in tests in 1930 and in India. But the anti-British feeling in India at the time, it being one of the peaks of India's freedom struggle, forced a postponement. And so the match was held two years later and here at Lord's. His Majesty the King at Lord's, where he greets the English team and the All India 11 during their only test match to be played this year. Well, Indians felt slightly nervous because they had never played a test match before and there were so many people shouting and uh, there was nervousness in our camp. Well, Muhammad Nasar was very fast and he was all the time threatening while he was running to the, to, to the, to, towards the batsman. Nasar had one very great advantage. He was very tall. He was about six, two and a half, whereas Lorwood was very short. So Nisar had that advantage. And then he, he could move the ball in and away. Whether knowingly or unconsciously, that I cannot say. But however, he moved the ball. My most vivid uh, recollection, really, I think, is of the two Indian bowlers. Of course, we'd never seen them in this country before. And um, Nisar and um, Arma Singh, I don't know whether I got the right pronunciations or not, but um, they created a very good impression with the England team. And I think Nissa got f at least five wickets during the first innings. He wasn't quite so successful in the second because Jahangir Khan, also a lively medium pace bowler, did very well. I think he got four. But in spite of uh, Nissa and um, Jahangir Khan, I thought Indian's best bowler, he didn't get as many wickets in this particular match, was Arma Singh. I thought he was a magnificent bowler. The wicket was a little more lively, maybe, right at the very beginning, but we did get an unfortunate start. I think Percy Holmes was clean bowled by Nissa almost immediately, and Herbert Sutcliffe got out fairly quickly, and then from England's point of view, we had a minor tragedy because Frank Woolley, who was probably one the best batsman in England, although he was getting on a few, uh, on a bit. Um, he unfortunately got run out. And then I think the skipper went in next, I think, Douglas Jardine, who stayed there. And I think he was undefeated, certainly undefeated in one of the two innings. Uh, I think he got 85 not out. Then, fortunately, I went in and I got missed. I think it was a stumping chance <laughs> before I'd scored, actually. And then I managed to stay with Douglas Jardine for quite a time, and we recovered and got a respectable score. But even so, it wasn't a very big score. Jardine was a staunch fighter. And under difficulties, he clinched his teeth and went straight with his bat and pad to stop the ball. Of course, uh, except for driving a little, through covers or extra cover, he concentrated on playing straight. We had good bowling side. There are there were five very very fine bowlers who could who could bowl for a long long time and get the opponents out. You had two very fine cricketers who weren't even playing in the test match. I don't know whether they were eligible to play, but I'm referring, of course, to Dulip Sinji and Patodi. 
Now, they were two magnificent test cricketers. Now, had they been in the side, that could have been, well, a different story to the results of the match. Their bowling, as I've already said, was up to test standard, but their batting wasn't quite up to test standard. I think that sums it up pretty, pretty easily, really. C.K. Naidu batted very well. He was a very fine cricketer, very fine all-rounder. Good bowler, good fielder, and a good judge of the game. He captained very well. I mean, every, after every second over, on the, when the fielders were moving, he stopped on the pitch and uh, told me all the time, every second over, well, you bowl on leg and middle. You bowl on leg and middle. Nothing, nothing, give nothing away. If they want to score, let them score off you from leg and middle. My feeling all the time have been that I was a good bowler against left-handers. My ball moved away, which the left-handers did not like. And perhaps it moved at a speed which they never gauged. I told, told my own cricketers, I'll get two men out, Vule and Penta, because both were left-handers. Our bowling was certainly better, in my opinion, than the bowling of the English team. Kemal Singh has scored his 50. Incidentally, the top score for his side during this match. India are all out with a total of 187. England win by 158 runs. Douglas Jardine then leading the recovery there for England with good support from Leslie Ames in the first innings. Mohammad Nisar, the leading wicket taker for India. India conceding a first innings lead of 70 runs, only CK Naidu impressing with the bat. Bose and Vos sharing the wickets for England. Jardine once again showing the way, a good innings from Eddie Painter, England declaring on 275 for nine. Jahangir Khan among the wickets for India this time. Only Amar Singh in the lower order putting up a resistance there. India losing by 158 runs. Flattering figures for Wally Hammond. The Indian batting improved slightly when the MCC visited India in 1933-34 with Lala Amarnath becoming the first of eight Indians so far to score a century on test debut. Then in 1936 at Old Trafford, Vijay Merchant hit 100 and shared in a match-saving partnership of 203 with Mushtaq Ali, who too got 100. But to lower these feats came along Vijay Hazare, who at Adelaide in 1948 recorded a hundred in each innings of a test. But almost two decades, nearly seven series and 24 tests after their entry into the highest level of the game, India still had not won a test match anywhere. In fact, the Indians were one down to a none too formidable MCC squad under Nigel Howard in 1951-52 when they went into the final test of that series at Madras. Because of uh, due, I have to introduce my spinners early, you see. Mankard especially bowled very well. He took uh, uh, eight wickets for 55. And in the second also, he got four wickets. Uh, England batted really uh, started well, but uh, when uh, um, Grimney was out, we thought it we will do better, you know. 
what I mean. Pankaj Roy started well, and uh, I think he's 111 um, uh, with uh, 14 or 15 four. Really helped us. Then the second was Umriga, who played very well. It was a great win for us, really. And uh, that too, after uh, playing 25 test matches, that was the first win ever. And I had the pleasure of uh, being the captain of India. England not really cashing in on winning the toss and batting first in this final test of the series at Chepok, Madras. Mankat the hero with 8 for 55. Apart from the hundreds there by Pankaj Roy and Polly Umriga, a good knock of 61 by D.G. Fatkar. England bowling fairly unimpressively. And the Englishman once again collapsing to spin, only Robertson getting a half century. And Gulam Ahmed sharing the spoils with Mankad. As for Mankad, he proceeded to make an indelible mark in cricket history as an all-rounder. He set up a new record by completing the double of a thousand runs and a hundred wickets in no more than 23 tests. Only Ian Botham has improved upon this feat since. Indeed, one of the finest and most famous of his Herculean feats was uh, here at headquarters, when he, in 1952, scored 72 and 184 and bowled a marathon spell of 73 overs, taking five wickets for 196. This match is widely and not wrongly referred to as Munkert's test. More triumphs awaited Mankad, the first of these in the inaugural series with Pakistan. He was in a really good form, I would say, and uh, against England as well as against Pakistan, he bowled very well. I would say Amana did very well um, uh, and made his uh, bowlers changes and all that very well and placing the field. And uh, he is always, uh, um, um, what do you call it, a dashing uh, captain, you see. Not a defensive, but he is always attacking. Fazil Mahmud was uh, supposed to be the opening best bowler in the side, and Hanif Mahmud was another. And the opening batsman, Nazar Mahmud, was also good. So we were very happy, really. And uh, that was uh, just the beginning, as you say, after the MCC2 of India, and we won at least first match against them. And then this win has really gave us the boosting, rather, and um, helped us in our future uh, matches. In this somewhat topsy-turvy series, India won the first test quite easily, but there were no hundreds in this match, although Mankad grabbed 13 for 131 in this game. The second test, Pakistan won without much difficulty, with Fazal Mahmood the star with match figures of 12 for 94. Nazar Mohammad got a slow but sure 100. Finally, 
in the third of this five test series, India re-emerged on top and by virtue of it took the rubber 2-1. Hazare coming back to the side with 100 and Hanif getting a very good innings of 96 there. In 1956, Mankad and Roy got 413 runs for the first wicket against New Zealand. Then in 1958, Shubhash Gupte took nine wickets against the West Indies. But even after more than 27 years in Test cricket, India still had not beaten a full-strength side from any of the then major cricketing nations, namely England, Australia or the West Indies. Indeed, when Richie Benno's Australians, fresh from their facile 4-0 victory over England, arrived in India in 1959, India immediately lost the first test by an innings at Delhi. The next stop was Kanpur, where for the first time a test was being played on a turf wicket. Winning the toss on a wicket uh, which has been uh, newly laid is always advantageous because uh, you know it's not going to get any better, it's going to get worse. And this was a newly turf uh, laid wicket. Before that it was all always a matting wicket and I couldn't see any um, grass or any turf or anything on it and the wicket was also a little uh, dicey, it looked to me a little dicey, sort of softish and I thought even if it did get dry as the day progressed or the next two three days it wouldn't get any better. So I plumped straight away uh, to bat on it first. I was a little disappointed as I said, uh, we didn't expect to be bowled out for 152 but uh, the wicket uh, was a little uh, unknown uh, quantity like and uh, our boys also played a little in risky uh, shots and uh, I was uh, on the whole not quite happy with uh, our performance of 152 runs. Well, there was no point in bowling, uh, bowling medium pace or fast there. Uh, Davidson was a great and most versatile bowler and um, he concentrated on spin there. You may remember uh, those of you who uh, were at the match that Neil Harvey caught, uh, let me see, I think it was Nari Contractor, uh, actually between his legs turning away at a uh, short leg from a sweep shot Contractor played. Well, Davidson bowled very well in uh, that match there, and he also bowled his spin in uh, later matches as well, depending on the pitch surface, but he was versatile, and that was why I used him in those conditions. Actually, we weren't as well equipped as, uh, as India, in those conditions, nor do we have anyone who bowled as well as uh, Joseph Patel. He bowled um, as one would expect uh, an off-spinner of test match quality to bowl. I don't think Jazu was one of the great off-spinners of all time, but he was certainly a good enough bowler for us on that pitch. He was too good for us. And uh, he did exactly the job he was required to do and did it very well. You couldn't have asked for more. McDonald and Stevens did start uh, on a very promising note. Uh, I started with Furizanath and myself. Well, I bowled a couple of tight overs, but that's about all. I didn't really make any uh, effect on the batman. So I brought, brought on Jasu Patel, who initially did not really bowl a perfect line. But, uh, you know, once he got into the groove, uh, he was supported by Pauli Umigarai, put on Pauli at the other end. And uh, he started a pretty nice length. He beat the batsman a couple of times. And that's how when he started striking, he really struck well. He was uh, turning, but I wouldn't say that much. Uh, the ball was not coming onto the bat, the ball was keeping a little low. And uh, he was, uh, Jasu Patel has uh, got a, a slightly uh, defect uh, in his wrist. He bowls more with the elbow and uh, not with the wrist as such. It wasn't quite perfect. The Australians were sort of, uh, you know, getting confused with the straight one and the one that uh, was coming away. Uh, coming into the batsman and uh, they were playing back to be on the safe side and getting beaten in the bargain, either getting bowled or LBW. If there was any form of panic or nerves about it, it was induced by the excellent bowling from Jasu Patel and, and I also remember, a long time ago though it was, that the Indian fielding was quite brilliant. So I think those two things combined uh, add up to far more than, uh, than any panic that might detract from the merit of uh, Jasu Patel's performance. He was, he was terrific in that game. And luckily for us, everybody chipped in with Nutty Contractor making a useful, as a matter of fact, that was the highest, 74 of the match. He got with uh, useful contributions from Nadkarni, Borde, Ramnath Kaney. They all chipped in and we put up a sizable score of 291, uh, giving them 225 to 
to, to chase. And uh, on the last day, the fourth and fifth inning, uh, fourth, fifth day, fourth inning. Once we had got uh, Harvey and O'Neill, uh, it was more or less curtains for, for them, you know. And uh, Paul Umerica, as I said, he was also bowling a tight length. And uh, he got uh, both these wickets of Harvey and O'Neill. And uh, there was nothing else thereafter. It was only a matter of time uh, when the rest of the wicket would fall. I would say it was a remarkable performance by any standards, uh, on any kind of wicket, by any bowler, let alone uh, Jesu Patel against Australians. And this Australian side was no uh, mean side. This was uh, one of the strongest sides ever uh, that was ever sent out, out of Australia. And I think performances uh, such as Jesu Patel's 9 and 5, uh, 14 wickets, uh, it's a fantastic performance. India batting poorly after winning the toss, the highest score there only 25 from Bapu Natkarni. Davidson the chief wrecker, Richie Benno also among the wickets with his leg spin. In reply, McDonald 53, Neil Harvey 51 and a good innings lower down from Davidson 41. And there the famous figures of 9 for 69 from Jasu Patel. Nari Contractor playing a crucial knock of 74 in the second venture. Useful contributions lower down in the order. Davidson capturing 12 wickets in the match, 7 in the second. Finally, Australia crumbling for just 105 in the final innings. Umriga this time chipping in with 4 for 27. However, Despite that creditable showing, India completed all but three decades in Test cricket without a single series win against any of the more established teams in Test cricket. In fact, even against another slightly second string MCC party under Ted Dexter in 1961-62, India no more than drew the first three tests of that series. In the second test match at Kanpur, I walked up to the chairman of the selection committee, Mr. Vijay Azare, when other members of the selection committee were also present and said, Dada, I want one assurance from the selection committee. And that is this, that if I as a captain come and report to you that a particular individual is playing for himself, and not playing for his country, then, and I don't want him in the side, the selection committee will view this in the right perspective and stand by me. Calcutta wicket was good. They were 170, 180 odd for five, I think. And it was lunch on the third day. And we had to have a breakthrough. Things were going England's way, and the new ball was due. I concentrated all the my seniors and my chairman of the selection committee, and all were of the opinion that we should take the new ball. I also decided to take the new ball, but the sixth sense was telling me that I think I should continue with the spinners. So much so that when we went on to the field, I took the new ball and gave it to Ramakan Desai, who measured up his run and was ready to begin his run up. When I said, please excuse me, stop, you know, took the new ball back, brought in Chandu again, and started the after lunch proceedings. Believe me, I mean, I knew I was sticking my neck out because I was acting against the wishes of all those who had decided to take the new ball. And I was guilty of not following the instruction, I mean, the, the consensus who had said that. But, well, I think that's the way this game goes. And when something tells you that you have to do and you do it, well, I think I was lucky enough to succeed. And in the first was Chandu got Ted Dexter bowled and 
he was batting with 50 odd and then in the next over Salim got a wicket and in the next over Chandu got a wicket and in the space of next 22 runs the whole England side was out. And that is where we got into the winning position. Barrington loves hooking and from the Kanpo test we were trying to figure out a way as to how we can make him hook and get out. And we did succeed in getting him out uh, in this vital innings when he hooked at Ramakand and Salim took a decent catch, very good catch as a matter of fact. I think the Madras uh, wicket played practically the same throughout. Highest number of runs was scored in the pre-lunch session in the series in this particular test match. I think once even Jai, Jai scored a few runs but even after Jai got out, when Nawab came in, I mean, the tempo was maintained and I think we were a hundred and thirty or forty odd before lunch. And that set the tempo. And as I said, everyone took up the cue from there and everybody played as if we wanted to win. And once again, having got the score in good time, we were in a position to dictate the terms to the MCC. Chandu got Ted Dexter out thrice clean bowled. He practically yogged him leg stump on all the occasions. You know what I mean. When you get a thing like this working for you, it is a very, very big plus. I mean, I had no hesitation to throw the ball to Chandu. Immediately Ted came into bat. I think it was the inner realization in each and every player that this is a better way of playing cricket than what they did before. See, it's like this. No tiger is a man-eater till he has had his first prey. And whether we like it or not, India had not tasted what it feels to win. Having tasted the blood, I thought the inner confidence came into our side that, well, we are no inferior to our opposition that we are playing. And it is this inbuilt confidence which I think matters in success and failure. If you dub yourself that with the feeling that you can't win, you can't win. And it is the taste of victory, I think, that changed the attitudes and gave the feeling that we can do it. And so India came into their own in that fourth test at Calcutta. Batting first, they got a good total of 380 and from then onwards they were right on top. Towards the end, Durrani and Borde bowled marvellously with their left arm spin and leg spin respectively. In the final test at Madras, Patodi got a maiden hundred in only his third test appearance and from then onwards India were again holding the whip hand. Eventually India winning by 128 runs. One of the heroes of that series against England was Vijay Manjureka, one of the best batsmen India have produced. Then Farooq Engineer blasted to a hundred almost before lunch at Madras against the West Indies in 1967. Next to hit the headlines was Mansur Ali Khan Patodi, first with a fighting hundred at Headingley in the summer of 67. Oliveira bowls Patodi, starts it, there's his century. And later that same year, Patodi scored 75 and 85 in two test innings at Melbourne, sufficient to move critics to label him the Nawab of Headingley and Melbourne. As the series progressed, we tended to get more confident and do better. In fact, 
We should have won the last test at Brisbane, which we lost by about 25 odd runs, if I remember correctly. So we were getting uh, into a team sort of spirit by the end of the tour. And this was the tour of Australia after 20 years, after Amarnath's team had been there in 47. So a lot of things were strange to us. Nobody had been there before. And it took time for the team to settle. And by the time we got to New Zealand, I think we all knew pretty well what we had to do. Was it also a factor that uh, New Zealand weren't as strong as the Australians that helped you to do better? I think that that was certainly one factor. The, and the other more important factor was the fact that we now came on wickets, which were slower, a little spongier, and gave much more purchase to our spinners than the Australian wickets, which, which were a bit harder. And throughout that uh, New Zealand series, the spinners really did themselves very proud. And uh, I think a number of catches were taken, uh, more catches than perhaps during any, any other four test match series. So we improved our fielding. As we went on with our confidence, we also improved. So to look back on that uh, first test at Dunedin, and it happened to be India's first ever victory abroad, what would be your main memories? I think uh, what comes straight to mind is Ramakant Desai's innings with a broken jaw. Uh, he's always been a very tough player, but uh, this was a remarkable effort. And uh, the way he played the innings gave us a lot of confidence, a lot of hope. And uh, apart from the fact that Michael Dowling also got a, a very good 100, we realized that if we did play to the best of our ability, that we were quite capable of beating New Zealand. And we also had some fine performances from Wadekar and Prasanna. Yes, Wadekar came into his own on those slow wickets. He found the, the harder wickets in Australia where he tended to play slightly across the line of the ball on the off stump. He was getting caught behind and missing and playing the sort of bane of a left-hander anyway. And uh, one or two of our other main batsmen didn't score as heavily as one expected in Australia. But on these slow wickets, people like Rusi Surti, Wadekar and so on, they came into their own and did pretty well. And what about Prasanna? Prasanna again found, uh, uh, well, he couldn't get many LBWs, which annoyed him. But uh, he found that he could turn the ball more. He'd bowled magnificently in Australia also with a limited onside field. And uh, here he got more purchase, more turn. Uh, didn't have the same class of batsmen. They would tend to lunge forward or to heave. So we basically put three men close and three men in the deep. So either they were caught bat bad or if they heaved, they were caught on the boundary line. But uh, having won that first test so comfortably, you immediately went on to lose the second one. Why was this the case? I think uh, it was just one of those things. Uh, I can't explain exactly why, but we knew in our minds, that by the time the first test was finished, that we intended to win the series, and we stood a very good chance. It's just one of those things. We went on to win the other two test matches reasonably well. Uh, you call it an aberration of some kind. Uh, perhaps we were not as professional as we should have been. But overall, the series was very, very satisfactory. And uh, apart from the fact that uh, Prasanna, Wadekar, and Surti did well, and you also mentioned the fielding, what was uh, the cohesion like in the team for performance in general? I think you'll find that uh, any team which is winning uh, tends to be fairly cohesive. Uh, it was a more of a problem in Australia where you were losing, that one had to tell the boys to keep going and not to lose heart. But once the team starts winning, they themselves become proud of their own achievements. And therefore, it's much easier to keep them going as a team. And uh, I think not only uh, did we enjoy our cricket because we were winning, but we enjoyed New Zealand a great deal because it is a lovely country. And what about the opposition, and Dowling I, and Motts? Well, Motts, of course, is a very fine bowler. And uh, Dowling played us pretty well. He got up the front foot which was the best thing to do against the spinners. And he got a lovely 200 also, if I remember, against us. He was a fine player. But we found the majority of New Zealand batsmen tended to lose patience and then go for the big shot, the big heave, for which we had these two or three players on the boundary line. And that obviously made a fairly crucial difference. Yes, it did, because we took so many catches that uh, I don't think India had ever taken so many in, in any tour. And uh, the high watermark for India on that tour was the bowling of Erapali Prasanna. In batting, Ajit Wadeka distinguished himself. And in terms of all-round performances, it was Rusi Surti who was the pick of the players. While this was admittedly not an insignificant achievement, it was 
to be absolutely honest, nothing to write home about, for victory over New Zealand in those days was only to be expected. In short, defeating one of the major outfits, namely England, Australia, or the West Indies on foreign soil now became the next necessity in the march of Indian cricket. Indeed, the Indians up to this point had never beaten the West Indians even at home, let alone in the Caribbean. But all this was to change in March 1971 when India imprinted the first of two sensational successes here at the Queen's Park Oval, Port of Spain. We knew that Port of Spain was going to be a little bit uh, slow wicket and, um, and then perhaps landscapes, if he, if he was to play against us, uh, would uh, really matter quite a lot to us. And that's the reason when the first match which we played uh, against President's Eleven, we saw to that, uh, that one of their off spinners called Nureka, who was uh, pretty old, he's uh, on the verge of retirement, and at the age of 35, though he was bowling well, so he wouldn't have uh, definitely caused us much of harm. So we saw to that that he would get more wickets, so selectors would find it very embarrassing to drop him from the side. And exactly the same thing happened. They had no choice but to select him in the team. And uh, had it been landscapes perhaps on that wicket, that port of spin, it would have uh, really mattered as perhaps he would have really uh, run through our side. But uh, when we landed in Port of Spain, I had a look at the wicket and uh, I thought that this is the chance to win. And the wicket uh, was nicely rolled up, but it looked a little bit funny. And I was hoping that I would uh, lose a toss. And luckily I lost the toss uh, and um, the Sobers had no choice. Uh, but to elect to bat, and had it been, uh, I would, if I was in his position, that perhaps I also would have uh, elected to bat. Uh, it was very difficult to predict one. And the first ball, Abid Ali bowl, was a shooter, and it <laughs> went to uh, went to uh, uh, Roy Frederick's defence and knocked his stumps out. And uh, that's where they, they they got really shocked. And then, of course, uh, they went on to score 200 and odd runs, nearly 260 or something. Trinidad wicket is always a wicket that takes spin. And India have always produced great spinners. And um, in that particular test, we didn't win the toss and batted. India won the toss and sent us into bat, which is a regular occurrence in the West Indies, in particular in Trinidad, because the wicket on the first day always have a bit of moisture and it does a lot of funny things. And then it settled down the second day and the third day, and then it starts to play tricks again later on in the, in, in, in the, in the, um, in the match. And India won the toss, which is always a good toss to win, sent us into bat, and they bowled us out fairly cheaply, and then went in and replied with a, um, a, a reasonably good score. And from the time they made that score, then West Indies was up against it because of the Indian spinners. I think that was one of Charlie's early, early matches. And Charlie uh, has always been, in my mind, one of the, the players in the West Indies who have always been a kind of dogmatic player, a player who came in and would stay there. He wasn't a very attractive player to watch when he got going. He played a lot of attractive shots, but he was a type of player who you could depend on. He was a dependable player. Roy Fredericks was different. Roy Fredericks was the kind of aggressive, aggressive player, attractive, and played shots. And they played very well during that test match. But one can never forget the youngster that came from India playing his first series in the West Indies, Sanel Gavaska. I think that he took the limelight of all the West Indies people. And um, he proved successful through that whole series. He made a tremendous amount of runs and then went from strength to strength. We had um, Nariko, who I believe got nine wickets in that particular match. And that only showed that um, if he could have done that with the Indian spin, spin attack, um, Bishan, Biddy, um, I think Venkat was there too. And, and there, there were experienced bowlers, and therefore they, they used the conditions far better than we did. In the second inning, when they came on to bat, uh, uh, the ball started turning, and with the uh, rough created by the West Indies fast bowlers, it, I thought that I would take advantage of that. And that's the reason I brought in Salim Durrani just for a couple of uh, overs. 
I thought perhaps he may be able to take the advantage of that. Bishan Singh was bowling very well, but perhaps uh, with his uh, kind of uh, action, it was a bit difficult for him to take the advantage of those bowlers rough. And when Lloyd was batting, I switched myself from slip to uh, switch to mid wicket, short mid wicket, and that's and the moment Salim I brought in, he just offered me a catch. Of course, that was a hard one, but it came straight to me. And the second ball, Gary so was faced, was uh, uh, bowled completely, I think, and the ball turned from the rough. And those two wickets really knocked them out. They lost uh, all this determination to get as many runs as possible, and and we had hardly 124 runs to score in the second inning, which we got easily. Of course, the lips of this I batted extremely well. Then our uh, Sunil Kawasko, who missed uh, the first test match because of the injury, he, he on his debut itself, he scored 60 and odd runs uh, in both the innings and brilliantly batted. And that's where the star was born. I have never really done very well in Trinidad during my cricketing career. I think over the years that I have played cricket for the West Indies, I have scored only one test 100 in Trinidad. Trinidad seems to be my bogey ground, as all cricketers have those kind of um, wickets, those kind of grounds where it doesn't matter how hard they try, they never seem to be successful. And Salam Durrani, who I'd forgotten, a very good cricketer, I think was very underrated as far as the Indians were concerned. I thought he was a, a very good all-rounder, and he, he batted and bowled extremely well, but I didn't think that he got the kind of praise that he should have got. I think people look at the other spinners, but I think he, he did very well, and he was one of the main instigators in, in winning that uh, particular match for India. So Wadekar and Gary Sobers not agreeing on who won the toss in that test match, but Charlie Davis easily the pick of the West Indian batsman. And uh, the pick of the Indian bowlers, Erapoli Prasanna. And a brilliant knock there from Dilip Desai, again in a difficult situation. Good support from Solka. A sensational haul there for Jack Noriga. Davis again one of the heroes, but uh, the top scorer in the second innings, Roy Fredericks with 80. Good knock there. Venkat Raghavan, five, two crucial wickets to the Rani. And easy going for India in the fourth venture with uh, Sunil Gavaskar, the star, with 67 not out. India winning by seven wickets. And uh, for academic interest, Barrett, three wickets. Within months of that historic breakthrough, which some described as a flash in the pan, India were in England. Here, they obtained an honourable draw in the first test, a less distinguished one in the second. And so, it was all or nothing in the third and final test at the Oval. English batting is entirely different than the West Indies batting. It's, uh, they've got a professional approach. Uh, they, they, they have very good defence. Uh, they go very methodically. So best uh, chance is to attack them if, wherever, whenever uh, we get an opportunity to attack them. It's a jolly good blow, it's a six, a magnificent blow over long off. Tolliver looking to get off the mark, it was a good throw by Solker and Jamison's run out. Oh, what a tragedy for John Jamison. The second time in successive test matches he's been run out and if anybody thought there must have been a certain test hundred for this batsman it was on this ground today. Hit it away on the leg side, it was a bit of a slog, but he's middled it and he's hit it for six. Very effective shot from Alan Knott, hitting with the spin. It's a magnificent stroke by Hutton, four runs. Really handsome off drive.
He's done it. He's out. Horton bowled Solka. Now Derek Underwood from the Vauxhall end coming into Wadika. Swung that away with the spin over mid-wicket. And he's hit that over mid-wicket for four runs. Oh, it's bowled him. And it turned. Pushing forward and the leg stump knocked out. Sardesai bowled by an off spinner from Ray Illingworth. And so it's not to be a hundred partnership. The third wicket down. Sardesai out for 54. And that is out. Caught by Hutton at slip. Wadika is out for 48. And he's found the gap. And that looks like three runs too. And that brings Engineer to his 50. And he's pulled him for three runs. the edge and it's caught beautifully caught at second slip by Fletcher what a lovely catch so Dolivera has done the trick again as a change bowler it's Chandra to Edridge oh middle and off well this is an uncomfortable period for Keith Fletcher just three balls to go before lunch He's gone, that unpaired, caught by Solkar. What an over from Chandra, that must be lunch. What a remarkable game this cricket is. Three wickets gone in a flash, and India riding high. Well, it's gone up in the air, and it should be a catch. And very easily and comfortably taken by substitute fieldsman Jayanti. Never in any trouble at all. But trouble now for England with Basil Oliveira falling with a score at 49. Looking to hit Venkat over the top, bowling without anybody on the fence, but much too high. And he's out, he's caught back and bad, a fine catch. Alamnod is out, Salk has done it again. Diving in from that forward short leg position. So still these three short legs hovering just a few yards away from Illingworth. Silly mid off. And he's caught and bowled. Full toss driven straight back at Chandra's acre. through past Beatty for four runs oh, he's out. oh what a good catch then can it slip and look at Chandra what a day what a day for India Just as the England captain went, so now John Snow. Caught and bowled, chipping the half volley straight back. 
Two wickets in the over. He's hit it away uppishly, and it could be out. He's caught. Underwood is caught by Mancad. A nice running catch. He had about 10 yards, 15 yards to run in. Took it very well indeed. So the ninth English wicket is down. Underwood is out for 11. Chandrasekhar comes into price. And he's out, LBW. I kept on continuing Chandra, and Chandra responded to it uh, so well. I mean, uh, I've never seen him bowling so well in entire his cricketing career. He almost hypnotized the batsman. Uh, he was really on the spot, and when he's, he was, he's there on the spot, it's very difficult to play him. Coming through for a hit single. Good throw, and he's out. What a run out. And really, that was a wicket thrown away by the Indians. Absolutely no need for him to take it again. Superb throw by Dolivera, right over the top. Just the one slip, that's a limit off now. So it'll be tossed high, and a brilliant catch there by Alan Knott. And that slow bowl by paying really good dividends, changes tactics, tossed it up, turned, and he's got the wicket. Vital wicket, of course. Sardesai out for 40. Oh, it's a handsome straight drive for four runs. Surely the deciding blow in this whole match. No, oh, really, no question now. Still five wickets remaining. Three runs wanted. And he's out. But he's cut that away, and that's going to be it. It's going through for the boundary. Nobody bothering to chase it. Abidali cutting Luckhurst away for four and giving India victory here in the Oval Test match. 174 for six. A victory to the tour inside by four wickets. I was fast asleep when Abidali scored a, a winning shot, a, a stroke. And that shows how confident I was. The euphoria arising out of 1971 was however, rather short-lived, with India, after defeating Tony Lewis's side at home in 1972-73, slumping to a 3-0 setback in as many tests in England in 1974, which included, embarrassingly enough, an innings of 42 all-out in the second venture of the Lord's Test. This trend somewhat continued when India were thrashed by an innings at Barbados in the first test of the 1976 series in the West Indies. In the second test, India enjoyed much the better of the encounter. The third test was, as they say in the Caribbean, something else, man. 359 runs for the West Indians was not a terribly big score, considering the kind of batters they had then. Vivian Richards, and Clive Lloyd, and Roy Fredericks. To my mind, Vivian was exceptionally lucky that he was let off time and again uh, behind the stumps. And on one particular occasion when he was stumped by a mile almost, and I remember this umpire gave him no doubt. When Vivian got 177 and Kali got 100. They both played brilliantly. Um, but I wouldn't like to think that we bowled badly. You know, we, we had only three bowlers amongst us, just the three spinners, myself, Chandra and Venkat. And Chandra got six in the first innings and second, uh, two in the second innings. I picked up four in the first and one in the second, and then Venkat got three in the second innings, which was a reasonably good contribution. When we play in Trinidad, if, you know, we always have, we always be slightly reserved in the sense that um, we, if there's any test match we will lose, we normally lose to Trinidad. And that is, you know, that is something that has you know, been going on for, for a long while. Um, so you always have this sort of reservation whenever you go to Trinidad. 
And we had this mythical thinking that um, it's obvious that you, when you go to Trinidad, you must play quite a lot of spinners. Um, but we didn't really realize until late, um, later on, um, that our spinners never won us a test match in Trinidad. Having made 359, we were quite happy. And then when we bowled England out, um, India out for 228, well, you, it's obvious that you, you, you thought that you were laughing, you, you know. Um, you, we were on top throughout the game. And then we gave, the, we gave them 400 out to, to, to make, which I would think in anybody's book is, I mean, you, you'd only back one person, that's the person, the, the, the team that's bowling. Now, unfortunately, our spinners, again, didn't do as well as they should have. When the West Indians declared in the second innings, I don't think it was a matter of making a game out of it. They generally meant to win the game because they thought, well, if the Indian spinners can turn on that track, why can't the home team bowlers? And, uh, well, they tried. But our batsmen showed a lot more determination and dedication and a lot more sense of purpose, especially Gauska, Vishwanath and Mahindra Ramanath, followed by Brijesh Patel. It was a great, great win. I tell you, one of the dream wins one can ever imagine. To be honest, we, throughout the trip, our main strategy was if our first four or five batters could last the second new ball, right, uh, we would make something like 350 or so, which is a good enough score for our bowlers to bowl against. If you bowl the opposition out for 228 in the first innings um, on a wearing pitch, you would think that probably your bowlers, your four, 400 runs, of, you, you, were, you wanted to give your, 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 your bowlers some time to bowl the opposition out. Um, we had ample time, and it's obvious that we, we weren't good enough bowling-wise, I suppose, because I, when we came to Trinidad, we changed the bowling attack. We didn't have as many um, fast bowlers. We decided, well, we, we had four spinners. <laughs> they, they batted extremely well. I, I'm, I'm sure that they didn't realize that they probably uh, would have made that many runs anyway. Um, but they did, and it was, it was well, a mammoth task, but um, if you if you um, applied yourself, you, 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 know, you, you, could, you could have got very close or even won the game, and they, they won the game. When Clive Lloyd declared that uh, 271 for six in the second innings, it was not in charity, surely. He wanted to wrap up the series because they were already one up, and if he thought, well, this is good enough opportunity. Now, if we were in that kind of position, I think, uh, we would have been a lot more happier because Indian spin attack has always enjoyed bowling forth. But in this uh, test match, we were batting forth against an attack which was not always sure of itself. It wasn't sure of itself because we were far more sure of ourselves. So that is the way I look at it. Vivian Richards, a trifle lucky to get those runs there, but no doubt about Clive Lloyd and Julian also playing pretty well. And once again, it's Chandra, supported by Bedi. India batting poorly in response. 41 from Vishwanath, 42 from Madan Lal, the only two respectable contributions. Holding magnificent with 6 for 65. A typically skillful knock of 103 from Alvin Kalicharan. The rest of the West Indian batting not so incisive. And the Indians sharing the spoils, Chandra 2, Venkat 3. And the great fourth innings, Gavaskar 100, Vishwanath 100, 85 from Amarnath and 49 from Brijesh Patel. And the West Indian bowling not making much headway. Following the